Chapter 9 Luke was so surprised he lost his balance and almost fell backwards off the trunk. By the time he recovered and righted himself, the face was gone. Had he imagined it? Was it just one of the sports family brothers home early from school? Kids got sick, like Dad said, or they decided to play hooky. Luke tried to remember every detail of the face he'd seen, or thought he'd seen. It had been younger than either of the sports family brothers. Softer, hadn't it? Maybe it was a thief, or a maid come early. No, it had been a child that he didn't even let himself think what another child in that house would be. He stared for hours at the sports family's house, but no face reappeared. Nothing happened until six, when the two sports family boys drove in their Jeep, unloaded their football gear, and carried it into the house. They didn't run out screaming about being robbed. And he'd seen no thief leave. He'd seen no maid leave. At 6.30, Luke reluctantly climbed down from his perch when he heard his mother's knock on the door. He sat down on the bed and muttered a distracted, come in. She rushed to hug him. Luke, I'm sorry. I know you were just trying to help and everything is amazingly clean. I'd love it if you could do this every day, but your father thinks, I mean, you can't. Luke was so busy thinking about the face in the window that at first he couldn't figure out what she was talking about. Oh, the bread, the house cleaning, the radio. That's okay, Luke mumbled. But it wasn't and it never would be. His anger came back. Why did his parents have to be so careful? Why didn't they just lock him in one of those trunks in the attic and be done with it? Can't you talk to him? Can't you convince him? Mother pushed Luke's hair back from his face. I'll try. But you know, he's just trying to protect you. We can't take any chances. Even if the face in the window of the sports family house was another third child, so what? Luke and the other kid could live right across, could live right next door all their lives and never meet. Luke might never see the other kid again, and he'd certainly never see Luke. Luke lowered his head. What am I supposed to do? He asked. There's nothing for me to do. Am I supposed to just sit in this room the rest of my life? Mother was stroking his hair now. It made him feel itchy and irritable. Oh, Lukey, you can do so much. Read and play and sleep whenever you want. Believe me, I'd like to live a day of your life right about now. No, you wouldn't, Luke muttered. But he said it it's so softly, it was sure, he was sure Mother couldn't hear. He knew she wouldn't understand. If there was a third child in the sports family, would he understand? Did he feel the way Luke did? <coughs> Chapter 10. When Luke went down to supper, he saw that Mother had set his two loaves of bread out on the china plate she used for holidays and special occasions. She was showing off the bread the way she used to tape up the crooked drawings Matthew and Mark brought home from school when they were little. But something had gone wrong. Maybe Luke hadn't used enough yeast, or he needed the dough too much or too little, and the loaves had turned out flat. They looked lopsided and pathetic in the center of the table. Luke wished Mother had just thrown them away. It's cold out now. Nobody would notice if you pulled the shades. Why can't I sit at the table with all of you? He asked when he reached the bottom of the stairs. Oh, Luke. Mother started. Someone might see your shadow through the shade, Dad said. They wouldn't know it was mine, Luke said. But there'd be five. Someone might get suspicious. Luke, we're just trying to protect you. How about a big slice of your bread? There's cold beef and canned beans, too. Resignedly, Luke sat down on the stairs. Matthew asked about the auction Dad had gone to. I drove all that way for nothing, Dad said disgustedly. I waited four hours for the tractors to come up, and then I couldn't even afford the first bid. At least you got in home in time to fix that back fence before dark, Mother said, cutting the bread. And yell at me, Luke thought bitterly. What was wrong with him? Nothing had changed, except he'd maybe seen a fence, except maybe that he'd seen a face that maybe belonged to someone like him. Matthew Marks suddenly noticed the bread Mother was doling out. What's wrong with that? Mark asked. I'm sure it will taste fine, Mother said. It's, for, it's Luke's first try. Luke muttered, and my last. Too softly for anyone to hear. There were advantages, there were advantages to sitting on the other side of the room from everyone else. Luke made bread? Mark said incredulously. Yuck. Yeah, and I put special poison in one of the loaves that only affects 14-year-olds, Luke said. He pantomimed death, clutching his hand around his own neck letting his tongue hang out of his mouth and lolling his head side to side. If you're nice to me, I'll tell you which loaf is safe. That shut Mark up, but earned Luke a frown. 
her mother. Luke felt strange about the joke anyway. Of course he'd never poison anyone. But if something happened to Matthew or Mark, would Luke have to hide anymore? Would he become the public second son, free to go to town and to school and everywhere else that Matthew and Mark went? Could his parents find some way to explain a new child already 12 years old? It wasn't something Luke could ask. He felt guilty just thinking about it. Mark was making a big ceremony out of bringing the bread to his mouth. I'm not scared of you. He taunted and took a big bite. He swallowed with great difficulty and pretended to gag. Water, water, quick! He gulped down half his glass and glared at Luke. Tastes like poison, all right. Luke bit into his bread. It was dry and crumbly and tasteless, not like mother's at all, and everybody knew it. Even dad and ma mother had pained expressions on her faces as they chewed. Dad finally pushed his slice away. That's okay, Luke, he said. I'm not sure I'd want any son of mine getting too good at baking anyhow. That's what a man gets married for. Matthew and Mark guffawed. Getting married soon, Luke? Mark teased. Sure, Luke said, struggling to sound as devil may care as devil may care as Mark. But don't think I'd invite you to the wedding. He felt a cold, hard lump in his stomach. That wasn't the bread. Of course he'd never get married or do anything. He'd never leave the house. Mark switched to teasing Matthew, who evidently did have a girlfriend. Luke watched the rest of his family laughing. May I be excused? Luke asked. Everyone turned to him in surprise. Usually he was the last one to make that request. Mother often begged Matthew and Mark, can you wait and talk to Luke a little bit longer? Done already? Mother asked. I'm not very hungry, Luke said. Mother gave him a worried look, but nodded anyway. Luke went to his room and climbed onto the stool by the back fence. In the dark, it was easier than ever to see into the house of the new neighborhood. Their windows were lit up against the night. Some families were eating like his. He could see one set of four people around a dining room table and one set of three. Some families had their curtains or shades drawn, but sometimes the material was thin and he could see shadows of the people inside. Only the sports family had their windows totally blocked, covered by heavy blinds. Chapter 11. Luke watched the sports family house constantly after that. Before, he had just looked up the back vents in the early morning and late afternoon, when he knew people were about. But he'd seen the face at 2 o'clock. Maybe the other kid knew the rhythms of the neighborhood, too, and let his guard down only during times he considered safe. For three long days, Luke saw nothing. Then on the fourth day, he was rewarded. One panel of one of the blinds on an upstairs window flipped quickly up and down at 11 o'clock. The seventh day, the blinds in a downstairs window were left up in the morning. Luke saw a light go on and off at 9.07, two full hours after the last of the sports family had left. A half hour later, the sports family mother drove in in her red car and stomped into the house. Two minutes later, the blind in the downstairs window went down. The mother left immediately. The 13th day was unseasonably warm and Luke sweated in his, in his attic. Some of the sports family windows were left open, though still covered by the blinds. The wind blew the blinds back a couple times. Luke saw lights on in some of the rooms, some of the time, in other rooms as the day wore on. Once he even thought he saw a glow of a TV screen. He had no doubts anymore. Someone was hiding in the sports family house. The question is, what could he do about it? Chapter 12. Harvest came. Matthew and Mark stayed out of school to help dad bring the crops in. Three of them working some days from dawn until midnight. Mother's factory got busier too, and she began working two or three hours of overtime every day. She brought up a store of food to Luke's room so he wouldn't get hungry while they were all away. There, she said cheerfully, lining up boxes of crackers and bags of fruit. This way you won't even miss us. Her eyes begged him not to complain. Uh-huh, he said, trying to sound game. I'll be fine. He watched the sports family house only sporadically now. What other proof did he need? What good did it do to him to know about the other third child. What did he expect? That the other kid would run out in his backyard and yell, hey Luke, come out and play. He munched his solitary apples. He ate his crackers alone. And in spite of himself, a crazy idea grew in his mind, sprouting new ideas daily. What if he sneaked into the sports family house and met the other third child? He could do it. It was possible, theoretically. He spent entire days plotting his route. He'd be hidden by bushes in the and the barn through much of his yard. 
It was only about six feet from there to the nearest tree in the sports family's backyard. He could crawl on his stomach. Then he'd be hidden by the face of the by the fence the sports family shared with the bird brain family. All those birdhouses might actually help. After that, it was only three steps to the sports family house. They had a sliding glass door at the back, and on warm days, they'd be leaving it open with just a screen. He could go in there. Would he dare? Of course he wouldn't, but still, still. The first time he looked out the vents and saw maple leaves shot through the shades, shot through with shades of red and yellow, he panicked. He needed those leaves to hide him on his way to the sports family house. If he waited too long, the leaves would be gone. He began waking up every morning in a cold sweat, thinking, maybe today, do I dare? Just thinking about it made his stomach feel funny. It rained three days in a row in early October, and he was almost relieved because that meant he couldn't go on those days. Didn't even have to think about going. He couldn't risk leaving footprints in the mud. And Dad and Matthew and Mark were in the way, hanging around the house and the barn, grumbling because they couldn't get into the fields. Finally, the rain stopped and the fields dried up and Dad and Matthew and Mark went back to their combine and tractors, acres away from the house. The backyard and the sports family's backyard were dry too. And it was warm again. The sports family left their sliding glass door open. The rain hadn't knocked all the leaves off the backyard trees, but the next rain probably would. On the third morning after the rain, Luke's stomach churned as he sat on the perch waiting the neighborhood, waiting, watching the neighborhood empty out. He knew without question that today was the day he'd have to go, if he ever intended to. He couldn't wait until spring. He wouldn't be able to stand it. He watched 28 people leave in eight cars and one school bus. Hands trembling, he made scratches on the wall again and recounted. Once, twice, three times. 28. Yes, 28. Yes, 28. The magic number. He could hear the blood pounding in his ears. He moved in a daze, off his perch, down the stairs, into the kitchen, and then out the back door. Chapter 13. He had forgotten what fresh air felt like, filling his nostrils and lungs. It felt good. With his back pressed against the house, he stood there for a moment, just breathing. All the months he'd spent inside suddenly seemed like a dream. He'd been like some confused animal hibernating during nice weather. The last real thing that had happened to him was being called inside when the woods were coming down. Real life was outdoors. But so was danger. And the longer he stayed out, the greater the danger. He forced himself down into a crouch and half crawled, half ran alongside the house and the hedges in the barn. At the back edge of the barn, he hesitated, staring into the seemingly endless gulf between the barn and the trees at the boundary between his backyard and the sports families. Everybody's gone, he told himself. There's not a soul around to see. Still, he waited, staring at the blades of grass just beyond his feet. He'd been taught all his life to fear open spaces, like the one in front of him. It faced dozens of windows. He never stepped foot in any place that public, even if it was deserted. Still, hidden by the barn, he made himself inch his foot for it. Then he drew it back. He turned around and looked at his family's house, so safe and secure. His sanctuary. He heard his mother's voice in his head. Luke, inside, now. It seemed so real. He remembered something he'd read in one of those old books in the attic about telepathy. Supposedly, if people really loved you, they could call out to you from miles away if you were in danger. He should go back. He'd be safe there. He took a deep breath, looking forward toward the sports family's house, then looking back again toward his own. He thought about returning home, trudging up the worn stairs, going back to his familiar room and the walls he stared at every day. Suddenly, he hated his house. It wasn't a sanctuary, it was a prison. Before he had time to think again, he pushed himself off into a sprint, recklessly streaking across the grass. He didn't even stop to hide at any trees. He ran right to the sports family's door and tugged at the screen. It was locked. Chapter 14. In all his plottings, Luke had never thought of the screen door being locked. Though he knew his own parents locked up at night when they didn't forget, the doors at his house had always been open for him, and he'd never been near anyone else's door. Idiot, he muttered to himself. He tugged harder on the door, but he couldn't concentrate enough to make his hands work together. Each second that passed made the hair on the back of his neck stand up more. He'd never been so exposed in his entire life. Hurry, hurry, get out of sight. The door didn't budge. He'd have to turn around now. That was what his brain said. 
what his hand did was plunge through the screen. He pulled the wire away from the frame and reached through. The screen scraped the back of his hand and his arm, but he didn't stop. He fiddled with the lock inside until he heard it click. He silently slid the screen door back and stepped past the hanging blinds into the sports family's home. Even with the blinds blocking every window, the room he entered was airy and bright. From the freshly painted walls to the sparkling glass tables to the polished wood floor, everything looked new. Luke stared. Almost all the furniture in his own house had been around as long as he could remember, and whatever patterns and designs it originally carried had long ago been worn away. At his house, even the once orangish couch and the once greenish chairs were now all a matching sort of brownish gray. This room was different. It reminded him of a word he'd never heard, only read, pristine. Nobody had ever stepped on these white rugs with manure-covered boots. Nobody had ever sat on those pale blue couches with corn dust-covered jeans. Luke might have stood by the door forever, in awe, but someone coughed in another room. Then he heard a strange beep, 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 beep. He tiptoed forward. Better to discover than to be discovered. He went down a long hallway, the beeps and turning to a dried out buzz coming from a room at the end. Holding his breath, Luke stopped outside the door to that room and gathered the nerve to peek in. His heart pounded. There was still time to escape unseen, to go back to his house and attic in normal, safe life. But he'd always wonder. Luke leaned forward slowly, moving a fraction of an inch at a time until he could just barely see around the door. Inside the room was a chair and a desk and a big apparatus that Luke vaguely recognized as a computer. And at the computer, typing away furiously, sat a girl. Luke blinked, thrown off. Somehow he'd never thought about the sports family's third child being a girl. She was mostly facing away from Luke, and she wore jeans and a gray sweatshirt, not much different from what the sports family's brothers always wore. Her dark hair was almost as short as Luke's, but there was something about the curve of her cheek, the tilt of her head, the way her sweatshirt clung or didn't cling to her body. All of that made Luke certain she wasn't like him. He blushed. Then he gulped. The girl turned her head. Ah, uh, Luke croaked. Before he had a chance to think of another word, the girl was across the room and had knocked him down. Then she pinned him to the floor, his arms twisted behind his back, his face buried in the carpet. Luke struggled to turn his head to breathe. So, the girl hissed in his ear, you think you can sneak up on a poor, innocent, unsuspecting girl who's home all alone? Guess nobody told you about our alarm system. A call went out to our security guard the minute you stepped on their property. They'll be here any second. Luke panicked. So this was how he'd die. He had to explain. He had to escape. No, they can't come in. I... Oh, yeah, the girl said. Who are you to stop them? Luke raised his head as much as he could. He said the first words that came into his mind. Population, please. The girl let go. Luke 